All right, wonderful. Well, good evening. Welcome to our regularly scheduled Zoning Advisory Commission meeting uh, for this evening, May 4th. Call this meeting to order. Jason, if you would please take roll. Christ? Here. Kemp? Here. Leffelholtz? Here. Mulligan? Here. Norton? Norton? Well, we know he's there. Are you muted, Pat? Or we can't hear you for some reason, Pat, but we see you're on the screen. Russell? Here. And Zucchero is absent. Sheena, are we okay to proceed? Uh, yes, we are. Okay. All right, so Sheena, can you please confirm we're in compliance with the Iowa Open Meetings Law, please? Yes, we are. Okay, very good. Uh, commissioners, in front of you in your package are the meeting minutes from our previous meeting on April 6th. At this point, I would entertain any modifications or a motion for approval, please. Mr. Chair, I make a motion to approve the minutes as submitted. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Jason, would you please take roll? Kemp? Aye. Leffelholtz? Abstain. Norton? <clears throat> Pat, we can, I know you said you can hear us. Can you, can you speak so we can hear you? Russell? Aye. Christ? Aye. Mulligan? Aye. Okay, motion does pass uh, for approval on the minutes from April 6th. All right, so this evening, you know, I actually want to pause for one minute. I, I do feel we need to get this audio issue yes. corrected really quick. Yes. Um, for everybody that's in the room this evening and those on the television or uh, watching online, we do have two um, commissioners that are attending uh, via GoToMeeting, and uh, one of them is having some audio issues. going to have Pat. There's two different ways to access the online meeting. You can either log in through your computer or you can actually call in a number and dial in. Um, and so we're going to have Pat jump off and then call back in and see if that doesn't resolve the, the issue. So apologize for the technological delays this evening. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you, Pat. All right, Pat. All right. We got you loud. Thank I apologize. You. We're good. I was logged in. I could hear everybody, but nobody apparently could hear me. Yep. All right. Thank you, Pat. So for everybody in the room, apologize for the um, tech difficulties. So let's move on. So this evening we have uh, two action items. We have two public hearings. Um, so what we're going to do is jump into the two action items uh, first. So our first action item is a uh, 
minor subdivision request to our applicant is Mike Weber. And the way that this will work is whoever the applicant is will ask that you come forward, state your name, address, what it is that you are asking for from the commission. We'll ask you a couple questions if we have it. Um, the staff report will follow and then we'll entertain a motion in a second by the commission. So with that, the first item being, um, again, a minor subdivision request uh, to approve the final plat of Adams Acres. So whoever's here this evening, come on up. Good evening, my name is Mike Weber with Weber Surveying LLC. My address is 26789 46th Avenue, Bernard, Iowa. I'm the surveyor on this plat. This plat can, is in the county, but within two miles of the city limits, so it requires your approval and the council approval because we're doing three lots. We're taking five existing lots and combining them into, or consolidate them into three. Lot one on the survey is the balance of the farmland of the five lots. Lots two and three have existing homes on it that we're enlarging the area to one acre to comply with the county requirements. If there's any questions of me, I'm available. Okay, very good, Mike, thank you. Any questions for our applicant up front? Uh, Britt, Pat, any questions for our applicant? No, uh, you're good. straightforward. Okay, staff? Uh, yes, yeah, so Sheena Moon, Associate Planner, a brief overview. The applicant articulated this project very well. Um, but this project is located on Airview Drive. It is within the two-mile extraterritorial jurisdiction of the city limits. Uh, and, with, and because of that, uh, it is subject to the city's um, requirements with respect to subdivision plats. Uh, the minor subdivision uh, is in effect, or it qualifies as a minor subdivision because it does involve three or more parcels. Um, and as the applicant articulated, they are taking the four parcels that you see uh, on the screen here before you and uh, reconfiguring, so enlarging the two parcels that have residen residences on them and then consolidating the um, primarily agricultural pieces of the, of the property. Um, it is under common ownership. Um, and it does uh, is in keeping with the uh, city's comprehensive plan, which identifies this area as single family. Um, we have not received any public input, uh, and with that, staff is available to answer any questions that the commission may have. Great, thank you. Any questions for staff with our commissioners? Pat, Britt, any questions for staff? Not at this time. Okay, thank you. At that point, I'll. Uh, Entertain a motion. Well, I move we uh, recommend approval of the final plat of Adams Acres. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second the motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Holtz. Aye. Norton. Aye. Russell. Aye. Christ. Aye. Kemp. Aye. Mulligan. Hi. Thank you, Mike. So this will go on to the May 16th City Council meeting. Great. Okay, motion passes. We will move on to item number two, a site Excuse design me, a site design Mr. waiver. I'm going to accuse myself from the uh, discussion on this one as I prepared the site plan initially. Okay. Thank you, Pat. Uh, item number two, a site design waiver. Our applicant is Chris Nauman. Uh, location at 3365 Hillcrest. Uh, is our applicant here? Good evening, fellow commissioners, city staff, and chairperson. My name is John Herrig, John Herrig Realty, and I was involved in the general construction of the addition to Clarity Clinic uh, there was existing about a 27, 2800 square foot main building that was constructed in 1989 by First Family Credit Union. And then over the years was 
purchased and sold several times. And finally, in May of 2016, I sold it to Clarity Clinic, which is a pro-life entity. And what happened was we ran out of space. I'm on the board of Clarity Clinic. We ran out of space, and so we added an additional 7,500 square foot area with a full basement under it. Now, uh, at one time, during the beginning of the construction, we thought we might be exempt from needing a site plan, but then the city decided it was best that we have a site plan. So uh, we did go ahead and had Busing and Associates create a site plan. Uh, when that occurred, uh, and he was working on that, I was in Virginia visiting my son and daughter-in-law and three grandchildren, and um, so we really didn't have a whole lot of conversation during that period, but on the original uh, site with the building, as it's shown there, uh, the darker space there that is building, uh, and you can see in red, uh, they had the dump, dump, dumpster setting in that area. When actually, if you take and come down to the north, or south, excuse me, south, there was a cement slab there just to the south of the building where the stairway went down in the original building. That'd be, if you take your point just over to the left, just a hair. Uh, we had the dumpsters, dumpsters sitting there originally, okay? I never gave it any thought, but once we went to work and we started uh, resurfacing that parking lot, which we had to do, uh, and we added some additional blacktop to get back to the new addition on the uh, east side of that building, where the uh, arrow is pointing, um, they had, Mr. Busing and uh, Mr. Norton had put the dumpsters at the very far end of the original there. You see them right there. So uh, in addition, uh, rather than having it that far back and putting a new uh, cover of black asphalt over the uh, new part, I thought with good common sense it would make, make it smart to put that as close to the street as possible and uh, for purposes of not destroying the new blacktop. And so I did have the city come up and I asked them how far I could set it behind the front line or yard setback, and they said 10 feet originally to me, unless I misunderstood them, I'm not sure, but I acted in good faith and thinking we were doing right. We added a pad that was actually 12 feet behind the front setback, okay, or a street, street right away, and um, quarter pad, and then we uh, commenced to uh, having the uh, dumpster enclosure built. And if you pull out in that area, there's plenty of uh, eyesight for traffic going either east and west on Hillcrest. So in reality, what we're here tonight for is the uh, variance to see if we can leave our trash compactor and dumpsters and our enclosure in that area that we originally put the cement slab. Uh, we appreciate any efforts that you give on our behalf and ruling in our favor on that. Okay, thank you for that. Any questions from our commissioners right now for the applicant? Uh, Britt, any questions for our applicant? No, no, no questions. Okay. Um, with that, we'll take the staff report. Uh, certainly. So um, as the applicant articulated, they are seeking a waiver of the site design standards um, to specifically locate the trash enclosure uh, within the front yard area. Um, the lot's about 7,600, uh, 800, or 76,800 square feet. Uh, as the applicant articulated, they have gone through a site plan review uh, for some additions and modifications to the site for expansion. Um, and through that, there was a trash enclosure location identified as is uh, shown here on the plan. Um, and to the applicant's point, they are now requesting to relocate the dumpster uh, closer to the throat of the uh, driveway. Um, the ZAC, the Zoning Advisory Commission, may waive the site design standards if they feel that it's reasonable and within the general purpose and intent of the code. Um, and the applicant is seeking approval for this location. Uh, we did consult, staff did consult with um, engineering and um, the engineering department did confirm that they did not have any concerns with this in this location. There was no visibility concerns. Um, or encroachment concerns, uh, and it is located outside of the visibility triangle. Um, we have not received any public input or feedback on this item, um, and I also would like to vote that the um, code does require that at least four affirmative votes uh, are um, 
you know, acquired by the commission or for affirmative votes by the commission in order to approve a site design waiver. And with that, we're available to answer any questions. Okay, sounds good. Any questions? Yep. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have a question about uh, the intent of the, of the code in this instance. Uh, what's the intent of the code requiring the dumpster location to be not in the front yard? Um, so th the intent of the code is to, um, as you mentioned, have the uh, trash, location, trash enclosure locations outside of a front yard setback. I think the primary purpose for that is really to um, move that type of activity, site activity, away from the front property line and away from uh, a lot more of where the maybe primary access in and out of a site might occur for um, pedestrians coming to and from um, the property. Uh, in this instance, they, the um, site does have a secondary uh, dry, or, uh, parking lot, um, which you can see, I'll scroll out here a little bit. Um, in the site plan here, you can see that the primary access point for customers and clients coming to the site would be to that eastern or western rather parking lot, uh, whereas the secondary driveway where the trash enclosure is shown here would be primarily for perhaps staff, and I'll let the applicant speak to this, but perhaps staff or any other type of deliveries and things of that nature. Yeah, it's a secondary access really, that second parking lot to the east. Sure. Okay. I had, a, I guess, a follow-up. So is the purpose of it uh, an appearance issue? So I think it's a, um, I don't think it's just an aesthetic issue. I think it's a functional issue, right? To not necessarily congest, um, for example, areas of the site where there might be a lot of daily trips in and out with respect to day-to-day -day, um, trips to the site. Um, and anything else? This is a planning service, services manager, Wally Wernemont. Um, so dumpster locations in our unified development code are twofold. Um, there is discussion about aesthetics, but we have the requirements for screening of the dumpsters. And then the other thing um, that uh, Associate Planner Moon is discussing is that vehicle traffic circulation. So when they have the commercial dump truck that's coming to pick up the dumpster, they're not uh, doing a lot of their navigating on public street system, they're off site. Um, so we typically have a minimum requirement of 20 feet. However, in this case, if they were to meet the 20 foot requirement, if you were to show that diagram with that red line, um, they're encroaching about eight feet into that required setback. Um, visibility uh, is still gonna be the same with regards to the location of the dumpster. Um, the bigger concern that we typically have with dumpsters is making sure that they're screened and they meet the screening requirement um, to help impact from uh, trash being blown around and then also the aesthetics of the dumpster for that. Does that help answer your question, Rich? Or? Yeah, so to follow up on that, the, uh, the definition of the front yard is the the 20 foot setback we use that, yes the definition uh, there there could be two different definitions so we have a required front yard setback and then there could be some um, cases where we refer to just a front yard which may be the distance between uh, the front property line to to a structure on the site so so the code says required front yard. In, this, in this instance with the requirement it says that exterior trash collection area shall be required located in rear and side yards only um, exterior trash collection area should not encroach into a front yard. The city planner may grant a waiver to this requirement when due topographic conditions or lack of the side or rear yard conformance or the requirements is in, impractical. So uh, if you go back to the site plan that was provided to you, you can see the original dumpster location was behind the building, um, located more to the rear of, uh, towards the back of the property. In this case, they're asking to have it more out in front of the property. So. Um, based on that definition, the front yard could be defined as from the property line to the um, from the building in that area. Okay, one last question. Yep. What is the standard for granting this waiver? Um, so the, the criteria for granting of a site plan waiver, let me grab that for you. Do you get that there, Sheila? Yeah. Yeah. 
So the code. Um, so the Zoning Advisory Commission shall have the power to grant such waivers from the site design standards of this chapter, which is the site design standards for anything in regards to the site plan. Um, as made reasonable and within the general purpose and intent of the site plan review and approval provisions of the chapter, if the literal enforcement of one or more provisions of this chapter is impractical or will exact an undue hardship because of a peculiar condition pertaining to the land in question. Um, and then it goes that we go into the discussion where you need at least an affirmative vote of three uh, or of four commissioners to grant the waiver. So basically, um, whether or not it's impracticable or will exact an undue hardship because of peculiar conditions pertaining to the land in question would be the criteria that you guys will be looking at. Okay. So in my opinion, it doesn't meet the standard, so I'm going to be voting against the proposal. Okay. Um, so some conversation amongst the group here. So one comment I would make is it appears to me, and maybe the applicant can give me some clarity on this, the, I mean, the actual front door is on the left. I mean, you enter from the screen, left side of the screen, right? Correct. So that is correct. The, um, the property's kind of turned 90 degrees, if you will, right? Correct. Actually, uh, the west lot line is the lot that we use for parking. Right. And it's the common parking lot for the, the new addition and the existing old condition. Yeah. At, at one time, the old building had drive through in the front of it or to the south of it, the uh, gray or shaded area of the building. And, and that's probably why they had the two accesses into the property. Yeah. So uh, in light of that, the dump dumpsters always did set to the south of the existing building and at the end of that cement pad that's to the west of the existing east parking lot. Does that make sense to you? Yep. So you see where the arrow point is now, right there in that slab there, they sat right in that area there. And, and so when we resurfaced that whole area and added blacktop back to the new addition, and that was basically for a drop off point for people bringing in new baby clothes, strollers, uh, existing used baby clothes and stuff to give to the yeah. young mothers who needed our help. Um, we, uh, and I should have had a discussion with Mr. Norton on this prior to that site ban being, being approved, but I didn't. But that being said, uh, when we blacktop then that area back to the Asbury to make it look conforming and new to the new addition and all the surrounding area, um, we just thought it was common sense to put the dumpster where we did. Yeah. And we did a nice job in enclosing it as well. I think okay. city can attest to that, and, and city staff, that is. And I think they're not opposed to it, but I mean, yeah. we'd appreciate your understanding on this. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Any other conversation amongst the commissioners? Uh, one, one last pitch. Uh, not wanting to do something is, doesn't meet the standard. Yeah. Thanks. Understood. Okay, with that, I'll entertain a motion or any further conversation. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to waive the site design standards within Chapter 13 of the Unified Development Code, specifically pertaining to the trash collection, exterior trash collection areas for the Clarity Clinic at 3365 Hillcrest. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Christ. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second the motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Jason, if you would please take roll. Christ? Aye. Kemp? Aye. Leffelholtz? Aye. Russell? No. Mulligan? Aye. Okay, motion passes four to one. Um, this will go before Site plan waivers are final at this commission. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I thank you so much for I your appreciate services. It. Yes. Yes, and time. Okay, that does it for our action items. Uh, we're gonna move on to our public hearings and I am actually going to be recusing myself for the uh, first item here. So I will actually turn it over to you. Oh, okay. Let me walk through just the 
rules to the game really quick here. So we're gonna ask that the applicant step forward, uh, state your name, your address, and what it is that you're requesting from the uh, commission. We'll open it for public discussion. Um, and then at that point, upon the conclusion of the discussion, we'll close that. Uh, there will be a rebuttal for the applicant, and then we'll move forward with the uh, uh, staff report, read any letters of support or opposition, consideration by the commission, and then we'll move, the board will move to a, uh, a motion. So with that, All we'll right. turn it over. Thank you. We'll start our first uh, item here. We have our applicant being Rob Decker of Axiom Consultants. The location of the property is between 32nd Street and Northwest Arterial, partial number ending in 6004. Looking to rezone the property from AG Agriculture to R1 single family residential and R4 multifamily residential to allow for single family and multifamily residential developments respectively. Is the applicant or representative here and ready for their presentation? Oh, real quick, this is Pat Norton, and I'm gonna I'm stepping back into the meeting for this one. All right, thank you, Pat. So if you could just go ahead and begin with your name and address uh, for the record. Uh, my name is Rob Decker. I'm the owner's representative um, from Axiom Consultants. Uh, my address, uh, work address is 60 uh, Court Street in Iowa City. Um, so we're asking for um, the for the property indicated above um, between the 32nd, um, the arterial, the northwest arterial 32nd, and then 32nd um, Avenue on the south, the area indicated in red um, for a rezoning, single family rezoning consideration of R1 for that area, and then a small um, multifamily consideration on the, yeah, on the blue part down below of an R4. Um, just real quick and a very simple overview, um, the intent of the, of the application is to do a single family, yep, thank you, is to do a single family development. Well, actually I'll start with the simpler part. Down below on the R4 it's to do some um, row houses. Uh, the applicant has indicated, um, well, we haven't gotten too far into that, but essentially just some multifamily housing row houses. The reason there's a gap in between there is there's a, a single family residence. On the upper part, um, the intent is to do um, uh, single family development. Um, we, uh, with the R1 zoning, as I indicated previously, um, the development is intended to be um, very unique. Um, something that is not um, typically seen in a lot of cities, I would say, um, but you're starting to see more and more of it. Um, the things that you'll notice in it um, is that we preserved virtually all of the trees, uh, the tree cover in it on that, yep, on that south portion on the bluff and then a major section up in the upper part. Um, we're doing, um, for the stormwater detention, we intend to do wet detention basins uh, as an amenity uh, with trails around them. The whole development has a trail system in it too. Um, pretty straightforward on the trails, but the thing that you um, notice potentially on the, um, the wooded bluff section, as I would call it, is we see kind of a, a park uh, hiking trail slash potentially like mountain bike uh, area in there that would be open to everybody, not just the neighborhood. Um, sorry, just looking at my notes here. Uh, there's also a kind of a core property in town, that square one. On the concept, they're indicated, it's indicated with um, like community gardens, uh, like community plots that you'll see in a lot of towns. Um, but the uh, the intent of that currently is, is to convey that to the city as a, a city park. So taking kind of the primary core of the development, some of the higher, um, highest demand property and, and putting a community park in there. Still in discussions with that with the city, but that's the intent of it. And then to kind of look at potentially moving those um, community garden areas and, and, and nice amenities over to the uh, west side um, where that kind of thin area is. Uh, we think that it provides both a community amenity for the entire neighborhood, but also provides a good opportunity to kind of utilize that same amenity as a buffer to sort of transition the neighborhood that's been, um, uh, that's obviously been there for a long time to the west uh, to kind of ease that transition. It's a, it's a narrow piece, so it, it, it kind of lends itself well to that anyway. 
Um, last piece, the, uh, um, we included the, the connection south onto 32nd. I, I know there will be some discussion of that. Um, we discussed that with the city, and there's a lot of um, discussion about it. There's, there's, some, there's some problematic things with it that are tricky in terms of design, in terms of uh, grade, uh, in terms of utility corridor, the, the geometry of it, it's very narrow, um, sight lines along 32nd. So we recognize those and are in discussions with the city about that too. So that's kind of a overall synopsis. All right, thank you, Rob. Um, does anyone on the commission have any questions for Rob at this time? Pat or Brittany, any questions for Rob? Not at this time. No. At this time, we'll open the floor up. Yep, you can go ahead and have a seat, thanks. At this time, we'll open the floor up for public input. So if there's anyone in attendance that would like to speak for or against the proposal, we'll ask them to come up to the podium uh, one by one. You'll start off by stating your name and address for the record. We will ask that you try to limit your uh, speaking time to about three minutes out of respect for other people. If someone has said something that you, know, you wanna echo or expand on, um, please come up to the podium and uh, state that for the record. So go ahead and start. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the commission uh, listening to us today. Uh, my name is Eric Lucy. I live at 2736 Tiffany Court. And uh, actually, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, many of the people that are here this evening and many who could not be here this evening. So uh, I would, uh, we're talking in one rather large unified voice. So I would uh, respectfully request. Uh, more than three minutes, um, but I will be as brief as possible. I hope you will uh, afford me that. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm going to do is uh, I want to first share some historical perspective that some of you uh, may not be aware of. Uh, I then want to share some concerns that we have about the development, and then I want to share some solutions that we believe can create a win-win for all concerned. Uh, the current residents, the future residents, uh, the city as a whole, and the safety of all concerned. Um, starting with a historical perspective, um, I have some intimate knowledge in this uh, as uh, this property, uh, Tiffany Court, where I live at, uh, there was originally a farm and it was purchased uh, by a, an associate of mine at the time back in 19, uh, late 1992-93. Um, and with the intent that he was going to uh, have a private residence on this acreage. I can't remember the total acreage. I'm going to say around 30 acres at the time. Um, he purchased that from Ed Chick Fry, who had actually was in the process of planning to develop it uh, and coincidentally uh, convinced uh, my associate that, uh, hey, maybe he should develop it. So he spoke to me about it knowing that I was uh, getting close to uh, purchasing my first home. And uh, he showed me the, the diagram of what he was considering. And it was actually going to be a horseshoe uh, initially. Uh, if you could just show uh, Tiffany Court. Uh, it starts uh, at the bottom of 32nd Street, or at the, and then it goes up, and then it would go uh, to the, uh, what would that be? The, east and then right there about there it was going to go straight north and then curve and go west okay it was going to be a horseshoe was the original intent um, about uh, the time that i purchased uh, i had access um, to be able to be the first lot to be purchased which i was um, and about that same that was in early 94 and about that time, uh, about the same time, that's when plans for the Northwest Arterial were subsequently being come forthcoming. And so that put the kibosh to the, uh, the, the horseshoe. And so, uh, because it was gonna encroach on a lot of the property, uh, and so he sold part of the property to uh, I guess it'd be the city or the state, uh, I can't recall, for the Northwest Arterial. And then there was some property on the north side of the Northwest Arterial, proposed Northwest Arterial, uh, that was uh, subsequently donated to the Dubuque Arboretum. So 
that's, I believe, the reason why this was originally called Tiffany Court and not Tiffany Lane, Tiffany Street, Tiffany Drive, Tiffany Road, uh, because it was always intended to be um, a dead end, if you will. So that's a historical perspective. So let's talk now about the safety of the residents. Um, our concern is not for the development. I want to be pretty clear about that. Um, we believe Dubuque needs more homes. Um, we're excited about the, uh, me personally, I won't speak for everybody, um, but I think many people would be excited about the idea of more homes being available, um, not just there, um, but we have also found out recently that the, that's 83 acres, if I'm not mistaken, that's going to be uh, for this development. There's another 100 acres directly to the west of it, it abuts right up next to this. Well, if you go to the previous picture, it's a lot easier to um, see. Uh, so the property where, the, where it continues to extend to the, to the east, um, that was recently purchased. And uh, I had an opportunity to speak with the new owner of that. Um, and uh, they do have plans to eventually develop that. Um, not sure whether it'll be residential, commercial, combination thereof. Um, but potentially could be another 125, 150 homes there. And I have it on good authority that just to the north where you see the, uh, there's a little track right in the middle that connects to the northwest arterial. Um, you can see, uh, nope, stay on that previous one. It'll be a lot easier. Um, if, you, if you go, you see the little circle there, like a little roundabout. Yes, right there. So on just north of that, north of the arterial, it's my understanding there's about 40 acres there that another uh, uh, developer would like to develop. Now, again, I don't know if it's commercial, residential, combination. Um, so I took it upon myself to uh, reach out to the developer of this property um, back in March 28th. I, I'm assuming it's the same Matt Mulligan that's the chairperson here. Is that fair to say? Yes. I'm yes. sorry? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so I called Matt on March 28th, uh, told him, hey, there's uh, some concerns, um, but I think I have some potential solutions. And uh, we talked for a few minutes, um, and uh, he said he was out of town. He would call me back. Unfortunately, I have not heard back from him because now I want to share the solutions to everybody. So, um, but first, before we get into all the solutions, we still got to talk about the concerns. Um, Tiffany Court, now if you expand out a little bit, you'll see that Tiffany Court is not its, just its own street. Um, it also uh, connects to what is called Bruick Road. Um, so Tiffany Court, you can see right there, uh, starting from the red line and working its way down to 32nd Street, and you'll see about right where it curves, there is, that's called Bruick Road. There's homes that have been there since uh, is the, well, the 1960s, uh, is my understanding. And then that bleeds into a very short parcel uh, called Blazin, which then empties out onto 32nd. Now, currently, again, for historical perspective, up on uh, Tiffany Court, there's about, there's 21 homes altogether. There's about uh, uh, 14 of them that are on that straightaway at the top. And you will find that it's about 50% of the people who exit or come into Tiffany Court who live up there use Blazin and Bruick Road. And the reason for that, I think I'm not really sure. Um, I, I personally, I use Tiffany Court, but my wife and I know a lot of other people use uh, uh, Bruick. And part of that, I think, might be more in the wintertime because of the steep incline um, might have something to do with it. So there's already that traffic. We're concerned that this would become a main artery. Um, having 105 homes, you can imagine um, 200 plus cars, and especially during peak hours, uh, mornings for work and school, uh, the amount of people that would be going in and out of there, uh, you could essentially landlock people on Tiffany Court and Bruick uh, where they would not even be able to get out of their driveway in some cases as they're trying to exit onto 32nd Street. 
Um, we know there's another artery that you're considering. Um, we would ask that that certainly be considered, um, the one that's going straight south uh, there that uh, I guess you're going to be addressing. But we also understand that it's probably only going to take about two or three cars at the stop sign there um, as people exit the new development and see, okay, there's cars already stopped there. I'm just going to go down Tiffany. And then as they start to go down Tiffany and they make the curve, they're going to see that there's going to be maybe a couple, three cars stopped there, and then they're going to go down Bruick. And so you can imagine the amount of traffic that's going to be coming through here just from the homeowners, not to mention um, school buses, because right now the school bus, they stop at, uh, on 32nd Street, either at Tiffany Court or Blazin, one of the two. Um, I don't think you're going to make the people that uh, have children in the new development walk all the way down there. So there'll be school buses, obviously uh, waste, recycling and such, delivery vehicles. So, and I could tell you, um, I'm not an engineer, but I suspect that Bruick and Blazin weren't really developed for this. They don't have any curbs, gutters, and it's rather narrow. So that could be problematic. Um, also for safety concerns, um, I don't know if there's been any studies done on uh, emergency access um, for fire ambulance uh, and, and the such. So, I've, I've, and, and now if you pull out a little bit, I know there's been some discussion, um, if you can show the arterial, um, where that originally I told you that, that exit to the north. And I can save this until after uh, the developer's representative has some more information to provide on that, if you like. I can come back. Yeah. If you or should just, I continue? You can just finish, yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, well, if you could go back to the original picture that shows the development, that would make it much easier. Okay. So, back to that little round area there, um, that exit that shows a, a po potential exit onto the arterial. Um, it's my understanding that there's a possibility that that could be a right turn in and a right turn off, okay, as a, a potential another access. Problem with that is, and if you just go on a little ride with me here, if you can only turn right, if you're going to John Deere, or you're heading north up to Guttenberg to get to 52, great, you know, way to get there, all right? but. We believe the vast majority, um, and again, I'm not an engineer, I don't do uh, site surveys and I don't do uh, traffic studies, but I suspect uh, reasonably that 90% uh, of the people are not gonna take that route because most of the people would like to turn left on the arterial and make their way up to, and I'm gonna use high V as a focal point because everybody gets groceries um, and everybody knows where that's at. So the high V out in Asbury, You've got shopping, you've got banking, you've got medical, um, you know, to get to medical associates, uh, Grand River Center, Grand, or Grand River Medical is building a new facility. Uh, there's uh, lots of uh, uh, traffic that would head out to Chavanel Road for all the businesses that are out there. They're not gonna wanna turn right on this spot, go all the way down to um, Central Avenue, make a U-turn, at the light, which I would suspect is not the safest option, and then come all the way back. Um, we've measured this. It's from that exit, it's four and a half miles to get to High V. But if you go down Tiffany Court, it's just over two miles. So imagine for a moment you live in that, you know, development. I think you know which direction you're going to go, okay? Um, it'll be one safer, um, not having to do the U-turn at the bottom, and even people who aren't concerned about safety are thinking about their time. Um, it also, if you think about going, to, uh, this is Hempstead School District, and I believe it's also Roosevelt uh, Middle School. Uh, so, same problem as you can see, that because they are further away from uh, High V they're not gonna wanna turn right out of there, make the U-turn down at the bottom of the hill and come all the way back. They're gonna work, work their way through Tiffany Court. Um, and uh, I could go on and on, but I think you get the picture. Um, so let me try to get to 
the solutions. Well, sorry, I'm going to take a little bit more time. Let's, let's, now let's spread this out a little bit. Can we see a map that would show all the way down to the bottom of the, the end of the arterial where uh, uh, Central Avenue or Highway 52, as it, it might be known as? Oh, that's right there, okay. And um, the, the uh, where's JFK and 32nd Street? Right there, okay. So that's a, that's a pretty good artery right now. Um, what happens, uh, if anybody's familiar with that, when they come up 32nd Street, it's no longer. 32nd goes underneath the arterial, wraps around uh, a, a BP station and uh, a true value. There is a stop sign, there's no signals there, and uh, that's already can be problematic during peak times. Uh, think of people coming out of soccer matches, anybody that's had to deal with that, or church. Uh, but imagine now these additional 200 plus cars working their way through there. Um, I don't know if there's been a study on that um, and how that could be impacted. Um, so here's our solution. We believe, one, yes, you do need to have that additional access on the 32nd Street. Um, we think that would, one, help mitigate some of the traffic that would want to go directly, because there's going to be people who want to go to Eisenhower School. There's going to be people who, well, they already do this. They cut through Arbor Oaks on 32nd to get to JFK, as opposed to going all the way around uh, the, up by the, the stop sign that I just described to you. Um, so there's still going to be some people. Well, if we had this new access that is being proposed and Tiffany and Bruick Blasen, that would help with those. But for the vast majority, what we propose is have a um, full access, being able to turn left or right, doesn't matter, it could be a stop signs, it could be, um, you know, uh, signalized, uh, it could be a roundabout. And that would help, one, with the people who are gonna be living there because they will use that, it'll be much uh, more beneficial for them, not to mention the property that just goes to the north of that, that it will eventually be developed, but also the property just to the west of this new development um, because that's all going to be need to be considered. And again, this was something that I wanted to share with uh, the developer, Mr. Mulligan. And uh, I, I'm glad that now we have that opportunity to do that. And I think reasonable people would look at this and say that's a good solution. Um, you know, there's an old carpenter saying measure twice, cut once. That's what we're asking you to do is look long term through this. And we respectfully uh, ask that you do not uh, approve this rezoning until there's an agreement made that there will be full access left or right onto the arterial and that will help the new development which we're happy to have and the future development to the west and the future development to the north. Um, I think I pretty much know I took over my three minutes but I hope that uh, I gave you enough information uh, for you to uh, consider. Uh, any questions for me? No, thank you very much. We appreciate your comments. All right, thank you. All right. Is there anyone else in attendance that would like to speak? Could you just start with your name and address for the record? My name's Terry Hackbarth, uh, 1951 West 32nd. Um, the single family zoning I have no problem with. I live right next to the two little, yeah, right there. That's my property. And they're proposing the multifamily, I believe, right next to me. That's a two acre lot there and about a two acre lot there. And I know they're gonna put a big massive apartment complex in there. I mean, that only makes sense money wise. So, there is no multifamily on 32nd. It's on Wildwood. It adjoins 32nd, down the street quite a ways. But most of them houses all on 32nd have acreage. 
So to put a big apartment building right in the middle of, of this, it just doesn't make sense. It's just not a good fit. So single family, I don't have a problem with any of it, but I sure hope you don't approve the multifamily right next to me, because that would, that would, I think, lower my property value for one, and it just doesn't fit there. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? If you'll come forward. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Paul Baker. I live at 2945 Breck, which is at the corner of Blazin and Breck Road. Uh, and the thing that I would just like to add uh, that has not been talked about so far is our children play in the street. Um, you know, they ride the ripsticks. There's no sidewalks. It's a, it's a recreational area uh, for people to go on walks. You know, in the evening, a very common thing to see. Lots of people walking their dogs, children playing. Uh, my concern with the extra um, number of vehicles that are going to be taking that turn, uh, sometimes they take that at a, at a higher rate of speed than they probably should because they're trying to get home. And uh, there are some large trees on the corner uh, between Blazin and Breck that obstruct your view going toward this development, uh, which I think increases the risk of uh, a child getting hit by an automobile, which I think needs to be uh, considered as you guys are looking at the most effective way for this development to happen and for the number of vehicles that are uh, coming in and out to do that in a safe uh, manner. Thank you. Thank you. Larry Berquist, 2797 Tiffany Court. Just want to echo the concerns on having a robust plan for traffic in and out of that. I think one thing that I had also thought about, uh, in addition to topics that have already been brought up, it is a beautiful plan, a lot of recreational and walking paths and, and stuff like that. I think people from the general public will also be attracted to that and just further uh, exacerbate the, the problems with uh, ingress and, and egress from this uh, site. So having that robust plan that does not funnel everything into or hold hopes on another cut into 32nd or uh, funnel things down into Tiffany and Pruick. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Kelly Dapmeyer, and I live at 2705 Tiffany Court, and thank you for listening to us this evening. I would like to echo everything that Eric Lucy had said, um, full agreement with what he presented. A couple of things that I would like to mention, um, again, it's about safety. I would like to see some type of safety study done on Tiffany, Breck, and on Blazin, because as the owner said, that's at the corner there of, of Breck and Blazin. Um, I've been there when people fly around that corner walking my dogs, it's very dangerous. Um, I've also been on the corner of where Breck and Tiffany uh, intersect. Um, it's an uncontrolled intersection is what I call it. Um, people come flying up Tiffany Court and again, very dangerous. So I appreciate that engineering looked very carefully at West 32nd. I think they you know, did a good job of that. Wally Warnemont sent me the materials. Um, I'm not in full agreement that they cannot do something for access at West 32nd. I think they made it work for our street. I don't know why they can't make it work there. Um, but I also think they need to take a look at Tiffany, Breck, and Blazin with a future study before you make any decisions. I also want to mention that the Northwest Arterial transferred jurisdiction um, to the city of Dubuque. And so while there was a time where we did not want access for the Northwest Arterial because it was an arterial. It's still considered an arterial, however, it's now uh, controlled by the city. So if the city would want us to have access, <clears throat> excuse me, for future development, uh, which would be additional housing or additional commercial, this would be the time to take a look at that. I know it would set a precedence, but again, this jurisdiction just recently transferred, so now's the time to take a look at it. Um, I'm very, very supportive of the development. I think Matt Mulligan and his team did a great job with the development. I think it looks great. 
I look forward to walking on those trails myself. Um, but again, I think the access and the safety. Um, one other thing I'd like to bring up is I'm not sure if the fire and the police have been involved in this. Um, our agency looked at doing a subdivision on the south end of town and we pretty much were nixed because of fire and safety. We didn't even get here because of the access and the issues that they were blocking us. And so I was just wondering if anything had happened with fire and safety in a discussion about the access through Tiffany and Breck. So again, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, next person. And if you guys wanna make a line just to help save some time, if anyone else wants to speak. Hi, my name is Jennifer Steinus. I live at 2733 Tiffany Court. I want to echo um, especially what Kelly said and the safety concerns. Um, I do support the development. However, my main problem with it is the safety. Um, same with me. We walk our dogs and have almost been taken out around that corner with Blazin and Brooke. It is an uncontrolled intersection with Brooke and Tiffany. You also can't see very well coming around the corner right there at Brock and Tiffany because there is a lot of shrubs. I've almost personally run over a child that was riding their bike cutting across at that intersection because you couldn't see coming around the corner. Both intersections are very dangerous. There's no sidewalk. There's no curb and gutter on Blazin or Brock. So you have to walk out in the street my, I couldn't, my kids went to Eisenhower, I could not allow them to walk to school. The city did not provide sidewalks along West 32nd. Um, when we go and don't go up uh, Brock to Blazin, we have to go down Tiffany and walk along the side of West 32nd. My kids like to go to the Arboretum as they were growing up. I had to make them walk their bikes along the side of West 32nd to get over to the Arboretum to catch Pokemon. It's not safe to put that much traffic through there, so I would respectfully ask you not to allow the zoning until there was a safe alternative. Another uh, issue that I have, um, have you all looked at the stability of the bottom of Tiffany in the street? We all know there was a sinkhole there. The city, and what I've read in the papers, is that they believe that that concrete shelf fixed it, but they don't know for sure, and they can't tell us that for sure. How big is that sinkhole? Does it go into Tiffany? Does that added traffic and the construction vehicles going to that subdivision promulgate that to open back up? That's a real issue that needs to be thought about here. Finally, I would like to say that this subdivision, if it's run through Tiffany is extended, it will devalue my property, and I am not okay with that. I purchased this property because it was a court. The name is court. It was ag property at the end. I knew that I would have a quiet enjoyment in my neighborhood. That is what I purchased the property for. I understand some things change. I'm very much for development. I understand that's how our tax base grows and that it helps all of us. I get that. But you can't change the game and not keep it safe for people and destroy the value of their homes in doing this. And that is what I believe will happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Greg Malm, and I live at 3110 Castle Woods Lane on the corner of Castle Woods and Wilderness. And I'm really speaking about the safety in the Arbor Oaks neighborhood group. Since the Northwest Arterial was put in, the access point from JFK to 32nd Street has been a direct cut through our neighborhood. Uh, Spring Valley to Wilderness to Castle Woods to Highland Park. And that traffic during the school time is horrendous. Uh, it's a safety issue because the neighborhood is turning over with a lot of very young children. Cars are running through uh, Castle Woods at 30, 35 miles an hour, which is absolutely ridiculous. Neighbors have put the little green men out and trying to slow people down, but people just, it's a quick shot. I'm afraid that when, if this development goes through, people are not going to go up by Steve's Ace. They're going to take the shortcut through our neighborhood again, and that's going to increase traffic even more than where it is. So I think access is a big thing. 
Uh, I think that's a lot of what was said. I like what Eric said about a lot of the thoughts and if you can work access out, uh, changing 32nd Street or changing Northwest Arterial is gonna be a huge issue. Putting a roundabout or whatever the thoughts are gonna be there is gonna be huge because the arterial is already stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. So access is key, and, but my concern is for the safety in our neighborhood, for the children uh, and for the people that live there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Paul Grievous, 3040 Castwood Lane. I'd like to second what Greg said. Uh, moved there in 89, and that was Castlewood as a dead end. Now it's a cul-de-sac under there, and then they built the arterial. <clears throat> now it's a speedway through there trying to shortcut to get to 32nd, rather than go out and around, stop sign, red light, all that other bit. <clears throat> so. Anywhere between 8 and 8.30, I'd say three out of five cars are doing, you know, 35 at least. I've had the police up there a couple times, and at 5 o'clock or 4 o'clock or whenever school ends, the same thing, 3.20. And then at 5 o'clock, you know, they shortcut through there because the arterial's, you know, shorter rather than go up there and stop the red light and go back around by Steve's Ace and down 30 seconds. So <clears throat> anyway, it's, uh, I've got seven grandkids under seven. And you know, they, I, we babysit three of them all week, but uh, it, you know, it's it's a bear. I mean, you can't even get out of your driveway. The number of cars and the, how the traffic picked up there. I just concerned about maybe 50 more cars going to Eisenhower during a day because most will have young children probably and, and go to Eisenhower. So um, that's kind of <laughs> my thought of it. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Hi, Laura Markham, 2964 Brandywine Park Drive. Um, I live in the, I guess the property right to the south um, coming off of West 32nd. So all of the traffic funneling through the neighborhood currently um, kind of goes around my corner. Um, I've been sort of, I actually found out about this development because I was complaining about the Eisenhower traffic coming through. Um, people fly through that intersection. I have six children that like to ride their bikes on the sidewalk. Um, and you can usually tell who doesn't live in the development by the speed they're going. Um, they don't use their turn signals. They kind of fly right through there. In about a seven minute period when Eisenhower gets out, I've counted approximately 90 cars going through that intersection at the bottom. Um, so for me, it's a concern. I don't allow my kids to go out during school start and close, which I understand those times, but I think there'll definitely be more, um, you know, people rushing to work and coming home later. Uh, another concern is my, as my older kids want to go to the park, uh, Arboretum, they'd love to bike on West 32nd, and it's too narrow. There's no, there's no sidewalk, there's no shoulder even. Um, I have a few children attending up at the Holy Family site and where the um, multifamily is slated for that area is very difficult to see um, it's right around a curve and you have young drivers uh, people rushing to school um, that area I think I, I would almost guarantee accidents at that spot and I just think in considering the northwest arterial um, again the, I think the, the property looks great uh, the development's good I, I had a hard time finding housing when we moved to Dubuque um, I just wouldn't want to see anything like Branton Lakes where we're having to you know, redo it later because it didn't have a solid exit on and off. Um, so that would be something I'd like to be considered. But, um, you know, aside from the development, if somebody could do a study, I would love to know who is cutting through the Eisenhower neighborhood um, instead of just <coughs> residential because it's, it is becoming an issue. And that's honestly how I found out about this was because I was trying to figure out how to pursue that issue too. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Tom Fitzpatrick, 2965 Wilderness Drive. Uh, first off, I hope to give an interesting or a different perspective. I both have little kids, which a lot of people in the room don't have. And secondly, I'm in law enforcement, so I have an understanding of traffic flow and cars going by fast. I am in that Arbor Oak subdivision. There's only two ways in and two ways out. It was designed to be a, a, you know, a quiet neighborhood. And then the city and the state made the decision with the arterial, which changed traffic flow. And now probably 70% of the cars that go past my house are not living in my neighborhood. So it is, and they, it's a shortcut. So what do you do with a shortcut? You're trying to save time. You go faster than what the speed limit is to save you more time. 
Uh, the second thing for me was school safety. Uh, obviously, uh, the city hasn't developed 32nd Street, whether it be because of terrain or because it hasn't been a priority. No, no curbs, no gutters, no shoulders. Uh, again, I had kids that we wanted to go to the Arboretum to play. We wanted to make it to the bike path. There's no way to do that on 32nd Street, not safely anyway. I've got to give my kids a ride to the Arboretum or to the bike paths so they can do the activities they want to do there. Again, a neighborhood park kids can't safely access. Arterial traffic flow, uh, that's great if you want to add that right turn lane, but I can tell you that it's not going to work if, it, if you do it. Most traffic does not go that direction. Secondly, if you sit on the arterial, arterial uh, the speed limit is 50 miles per hour. I can tell you from running traffic on that road, nothing is moving at 50 miles per hour. And secondly, he mentioned it's an extra two miles to go down to the, uh, to the highway and turn around. I can tell you what they're going to do. They're going to do a U-turn. And now you've got U-turns happening, where it's, where, whether it be illegal or not illegal, or not legal, they're still doing it. And it's still a, a risk to, to everybody driving that area. Uh, I'm sure you're going to have some people come up here from uh, some organizations that say how good this is for the city. I, I don't doubt it's good for the city. Uh, I think there's tons of good things this offers. I just think it's the wrong spot. Um, you know, that land has been there about 20 years since the arterial has been there. And there's a reason it hasn't been developed up till now. And the reason it hasn't been develop, developed up till now is there's not a good way of doing it. Uh, not without taking shortcuts or not without spending a ton of money to make it work. And I, tonight I haven't heard anything that was going to remedy any of the situations that, we've, uh, that we're concerned about. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Chad Cox. Uh, I live at 2742 Tiffany Court. Um, would you mind switching over to the subdivision map? Thank you. Um, we've lived at Tiffany Court for over a quarter of a century. One of the reasons that we were drawn to it was because it was a quiet court. Um, and I, I guess as far as this proposed subdivision, again, I want to echo what Eric and others have said. I think it's a great idea. Um, I come at it from a concerns as one who lives on Tiffany Court. We've been told that the only real access proposed at this time is Tiffany Court and a right in, right out at the arterial. Um, I strongly believe, and I don't think I'm the only one, that probably 90 to 95 percent of the people are not going to want to take a right out of, uh, the, out, of the process, out of the subdivision and go northwest, northeast on the arterial. Uh, therefore, I think a, a clear, clear majority of vehicles is going to get diverted onto Tiffany Court and Bruick and Blossom. And we've also heard concerns from the people across 32nd Street about Arbor Oaks. It's going to result in a huge flow of traffic, a veritable um, uh, fire hose of traffic coming down Tiffany Court. 105 houses, uh, maybe 200 cars, delivery cars, buses, emergency vehicles. I just, um, I don't know that the city's really thought this out, especially as was pointed out, when the Ehrlich Farm line to the east gets developed, when the Gantz property to the north gets developed, th there's absolutely going to have to be an, a full intersection of the arterial. And that, that intersection is key to straightening out this and getting it right the first time. Um, I don't know that the city has studied the impacts on what this is going to do at Tiffany Court and 32nd Street, what it's going to do up at JFK and 32nd Street, which is already a kind of a botched intersection, especially when the soccer complex gets out. But, but he put another 105 homes up here, all of which are going to come out on the Tiffany Court because going out the arterial to Guttenberg doesn't get anybody anywhere. Um, again, we'd like to support the project. Access is the issue. Um, and I know that this owner purchased access rights to the arterial. And we're asking that that be entertained. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Fernanda Kramer. I live at 2739 Tiffany Court. And uh, thank you, everybody, for the great points uh, you all made regarding the long term, assuming the plan gets completed. I just had a question regarding the construction itself. I have not heard anything about the plans to actually access the site with bulldozers, excavators, concrete trucks, whatever all heavy equipment will have to go to the site 
and uh, complete the building of 105 houses. So um, I don't know where the result of the hearing is going to be, but I, I really think we would like to hear what the plans are for all this heavy equipment, whether it, it would come through uh, Tiffany and the streets next to us. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, Keith Lucy. I live at uh, 3065 Huntington Drive in Arbor Oaks there. Um, and again, I'm not against the development of the city and having some great homes there. Um, and I'm sure the city's already done some planning. I'm not looking to dwell on the sinkholes or all the mines that are actually underneath all of that, because you've probably studied all that and you wouldn't certainly vote on anything before knowing where everything is at for the weight. But the traffic patterns, I would definitely ask you, before you approve anything for rezoning, you asked about the intent there, Rich, earlier about for the intent of zoning for some trash cans that are gonna be eight feet closer to the road. I think the, uh, the traffic patterns here, the initial 120 to 150 residents or uh, dwellings that'll be here, plus just to the east there, probably an additional 200 plus dwellings that'll be over there is gonna be significantly larger than I think we're anticipating these small little veins could even handle at this point. Then you add in three or four months of the year with the weather as it is too. There's only gonna be coming down Tiffany Court or through Arbor Oaks and the traffic right there right now as uh, the officers and several neighbors have mentioned, it's heavy right now. Uh, we see small children. I stopped one the other day, literally crossing the street, just a little bitty guy. And if you've got an extra four or 500 cars going through there throughout the day, I, I would certainly hope you would do more study before approving the rezoning at all to make sure that traffic patterns are planned in advance before you pass the zoning or change the zoning. And I'm curious what the intent of uh, was why it was agricultural. Are we still, do we have some intent with that too as far as changing from ag to uh, residential here, especially multifamily dwellings that are currently right now? Who's to say how many multifamily dwellings are gonna be up in there? So it could be three, 400 more dwellings on the east side there as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Is there anyone else in attendance that would like to speak? All right. With uh, hearing none, we'll offer a rebuttal from Rob if you want to come up and add anything. <coughs> the, only, the only rebuttal I have, and just on my personal level, those are all actually very good comments. I, I appreciate all of them. The only one I wanted to state was kind of earlier on. The intent of those um, multifamilies is not that they're large apartment buildings. The intent of those is that they're row houses. It's a much lower density. Um, and oftentimes we would have to work with, we would work with, with Wally and Sheena actually, but oftentimes the intent of those row houses is that they're actually condominiumized or um, single family. There are zonings that will consider those single family to, um, so they could be in a, obviously we're just showing a placeholder because it's a concept, but those can be in little, they're not usually in duplex, they're usually in like little four packs or six packs of row houses. So that's the intent of those. It's not to be a big two or three or four story apartment building. So that's the only comment I had. All right, thank you. Something to add, Matt? Okay. So as the, well, Matthew Mulligan, 1167 Hunter's Ridge. So I'm the developer of the project and we actually held a uh, neighborhood meeting originally and we proposed the site plan that's, that's in front of you. This is obviously schematic in nature. Um, there are certainly some components that uh, we really do enjoy uh, as was represented by those that spoke as well. Um, we also heard a lot of the very similar comments that you heard this evening. So as we're all aware, the next steps are quite stringent after the rezoning. So there are site plan reviews that do have to occur. That's not what we're doing this evening. What is being asked on behalf of uh, Switch Homes via Axiom 
is the rezoning from agricultural to R1. And so, and it, obviously an R4 on the south side there as well. So I do wanna highlight as the developer, we hear every comment that was said this evening and they're very meaningful. And so our desired state is to come up with a conclusion that is amicable for all parties. We all know that Dubuque, we need this housing and we need it badly. Um, and I do think there's a solution somewhere in there in terms of what an ingress and egress could look like. Uh, but I do wanna highlight the fact that, you know, the, the ask tonight is a rezone from ag to R1. There is a ton of work and a ton of conversations and dialogue and studies and things of that nature that will clearly need to occur prior to actually finalizing any form of a, a site plan. I also wanna highlight the fact that this is gonna be done in phases. So what's on the north side will be phase one. What is on the south side will be phase two. Um, and so with that, I appreciate everybody's comments tonight. They're all valid, they're all very uh, important, need to be uh, taken into consideration as that site plan is really dealt with in terms of creating a solution that is clearly safe for uh, residences that do exist, those will that that will exist in the future and those as they discuss that could exist to the east as well. So thank All you. Right. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Matt, I do have a question for you. Uh, do you anticipate this being a plat, platted uh, development or is it a site plan sort of PUD sort of thing? What's in front of you right now? Are you asking about this particular site plan right here? Yes. So, Commissioner Russell, this is strictly schematic as it stands. Um, there's 105 homes currently, as, as um, was stated earlier, you know, there's a park that could very well go in the center versus gardens. There's a lot of additional conversations that have to occur before we even get to the point where we have a platted situation. We are going through the process. Of, we decided to go in R1 versus a planned unit development, which maybe is what you're asking. So mm -hmm. we did cho choose to go down the R1 versus the PUD route for right, right now. That helps, thanks. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Matt? All right, I wanna thank everyone for coming out with uh, their time and their comments. We do um, appreciate that. At this time, I will close the public input and I will ask the staff to uh, present the staff report. I'm gonna try to do double duty here, talk and run this at the same time. So Planning Services Manager, Wally Wernemont. Um, the request before you um, is to look at rezoning this parcel of land. Um, the, the parcel is uh, you know, quite a few acres uh, located between the Northwest Arterial and 32nd Street Avenue. Um, there is a uh, stub street that extends to the property to the west. Um, it is irregular in shape, as you can see it there. There are some carve outs from other larger um, acreages located off of West 32nd Street that has access to that um, and extends over to the west. But there are some portions that extend down to West 32nd Street. <clears throat> There's a wooded hillside bluff um, that you can see as mentioned before. And the majority of the land is grade or is being used for agricultural production at this time. So as, oops, as noted here, jumping around here, there you go. Um, just go through this briefly. Um, as noted on the rezoning exhibit, um, there are portions of this that are being proposed to be rezoned to R1 single family residential. Um, to answer your question, Commissioner Russell, um, if it were to be like condominiumized on one large lot, um, similar to the vintage estates of Dubuque, as a recent development that came through this uh, commission, um, that would require a plan unit development. Um, in this case, um, they're requesting rezoning for R1 single family, which would then um, require that the minimum lot sizes for a development, which would go through a platting process, which would be the additional step after uh, they would get approval for the rezoning, would be minimum lot sizes of 50 feet of street frontage and 5,000 square feet of lot area. Um, those can be fluctuated. Um, they can increase with more frontage or square footage. Anything less than that would require uh, plan unit development as being requested, that would be the minimum lot sizes that you would see in this development. Um, the R4 um, area shaded in blue, as mentioned before, um, is looking at having access off 32nd Street. 
Um, we would review and require a site plan for that development. Anything that's a uh, threeplex or more requires a site plan. It goes through our development review team. Uh, our development review team is comprised of our planning, uh, building, fire, engineering, and water departments. And as part of that site plan review process, we look at um, site design standard requirements for parking, setbacks, fire access control, storm water, and some other things that are associated with that. Um, this is just a location or just a concept plan of the development. So I just want to just reiterate that this is conceptual in nature. Typically, when we have rezonings that come through, we may receive a concept plan. Um, just because what you're seeing before you isn't necessarily what may actually get constructed. Um, as we mentioned, this will still require to go through a platting process, which would require a preliminary plat, which would come before this commission, and then we'd send it on to the city council. And then after that review of that preliminary plat, that will then come through the pl final plat process, which um, the developer has just indicated it may phase it in a couple of phases. Uh, the final plat will come to the city council for their review and approval um, after approval of preliminary plat. All those final plats that come through here in the preliminary plat are handled just like a site plan. Um, as, site, as subdivision review is um, conducted, that is taken to our development review team. Uh, we review the plat to make sure it conforms with uh, lot sizes, uh, stormwater runoff, grading, street location, street access, traffic, um, landscaping. Uh, there's also a requirement for park development for major subdivisions like this. Um, there are sustainability requirements that have to meet uh, 40 points of sustainability tool requirements um, as part of the subdivision and um, several other th aspects that come in with, through that review. Um, the preliminary plat is preliminary. It does come through here. You do review that. Um, but when the final plat comes before the city council, there are requirements for improvement plans. And improvement plans are basically the actual construction documents that will actually come in place for how the subdivision will look like. What, what's the depth of the, uh, or the width of the streets, the concrete build out? Where is the access? And then when we look at access, which is a primary concern before you tonight, um, the engineering department does go through several studies. Uh, they do have the ability to require uh, traffic studies and additional studies with regards to locations to access to the development. Um, they look at uh, vehicle counts, average daily traffic. They look at uh, speed. They look at um, fire access, emergency access. So the fire department will definitely be looking at this for not only water and fire hydrant locations, but do they have the ability to get the large apparatuses up the roadway for grades and everything for access to the development. That's all handled through a code review through those various departments. And prior to that final plat being approved, those improvement plans have to be approved um, in order for us to take it to the city council. And um, at that time, uh, when that final plat is being reviewed, there's a request for these streets to be uh, either dedicated to the city for public purpose, so that would be uh, whether or not the city decides to accept them for public maintenance, so that would be plowing, um, any other things that may come associated with it uh, in the future, road maintenance, road construction. Um, so there's a lot of additional review that will go into this subdivision. But as mentioned before, the request before you tonight is to look at rezoning this property from uh, agricultural to R1 and R4 zoning. So I just want to kind of pull up our zoning map, our existing zoning map, and this doesn't show it very well. Um, the areas that are all shaded in yellow currently are zoned R1, single family residential. And the area that's highlighted in red um, is the proposed site development. And as you noticed, that area is actually in a, a green color. I probably should have made a little bit more contrasting color. But this development is already surrounded by R1 single family residential development, not only to the east, but to the west with Tiffany Court and to the south. And the reason for the property to be ag is when properties are annexed into the city, they come in as agriculture unless they are requesting a specific zoning at that time. And agricultural zoning is a holding zone for the ability to use actual agricultural purposes to continue to do that, but also a holding zone for future development for review processes that we go through. Um, as you will see as I step through some of these additional aerial photos, I'm just going to take you a little step through time um, of the area here, and I apologize because the 1930 aerial photo resolution is not going to be as great as we move through this, but 
Uh, what you see before here is the area outlined in red is the actual development, and we're completely surrounded by farm fields, even to the south. Ooh, got totally kicked out. There we go. Um, the area is completely um, surrounded by uh, res or agricultural land to the south. This roadway, which is actually 32nd Street, was actually Millville, was the actual original name, um, for the connectivity through that. So it's, it's mainly farmland. Um, in the 50s, we started to see a little bit more development post-World War II. Um, you can see more residential subdivision kind of popping up to the south. Agricultural land that's changing the residential and extension of roadways. And as I continue to step through time here, 1964, we're starting to see those developments that are located off of Kane Street and Kaufman Avenue to the south. Uh, there's Carter, Carter Road is the main area here that you're seeing to the north. And then, whoa, super touchy. Oh, I know what's going on here. Um, in the 1970s, as we move forward, um, if I switch back to the 1960s here, um, Brook Lane and Blazin are just starting to develop here uh, to the uh, west of the development. Um, you can kind of see it. It's kind of building out here as we move forward. Um, now we're starting to see houses built um, in there during the 70s and the 80s. There were some that were built in the 60s. Tiffany Court is this area located here. It's residential in nature. Um, you see that the Northwest Arterial obviously is not constructed at this time. As we keep moving forward time, Blazin and Brook Lane starting to fill up a little bit more. Um, this area in 94 is starting to be graded. And I'll step through the platting process that, that created Tiffany Court and why we have the current Stub Street that we do. Um, and as we continue to move on, 96. Um, you're starting to see houses built on the south side of Tiffany Court. 2000, there's more houses building to the north now. And as we continue to develop, you're starting to see development around the Arboretum and then across JFK with other areas that are agricultural and continually to be expanded as we move through time. 2005, 2009, uh, 2010. So we're starting to really fill out our uh, area to the north. And here's our current photo of the aerial for 2020. So as I mentioned before, you know, how did we, how did we get this Stub Street? How did this all come about? So this is the plat that was submitted. It was recorded in February of 1994 that established um, Tiffany Court. Um, Tiffany Court is labeled as Lot C. Um, we require uh, public streets to be platted off separately for public dedication. But we have these uh, residential lots that are located to the south. And as I step through here, you'll see um, this is the western edge of the subject property to be rezoned. And this area that's shaded in blue is the stub street that's platted to that property line. Located on the plat is this area that I highlighted in yellow, um, which actually labels it as a temporary cul-de-sac easement. Um, and the reason why we have temporary cul-de-sac easements at the end of stub streets is so people can go in and turn around and exit, not have to use people's personal driveways to currently turn around and exit out of the development. And then also, you know, we have Brook Road. So we had the same situation with Brook Road, which ended in, into a cul-de-sac. Um, when this development came through, Brook Road was extended and connected onto Tiffany Court uh, and made that extension as these areas developed. Then subsequently, uh, we had an additional plat that came in that created those residential lots located to the north. And then we have this larger lot known as Lot 8. And that's the lot that uh, Mr. Lucy was indicated that was owned by a, um, uh, Mr. Briggs at the time, who was looking at dedicating that to the Arboretum, which was later on dedicated to the city, which created those additional lots here, so lots 1 through 7. But once again, we still have the temporary cul-de-sac easement located at the end of the stub street to the property, noting that in the future that there will be connectivity to the adjoining property. Um, the next uh, plat we have here is that subsequent subdivision of the land, which actually took that, stubs, that cul temporary cul-de-sac area and created an additional building lot where there is a home built on it today. 
and then we have our lots 2-8, and then um, eventually those lots off of that uh, uh, large lot behind the homes on Tiffany Court was subdivided and all those were sold off to the adjoining properties, um, which then gets us to um, those larger lots on the north side of Tiffany Court. Um, the reasoning for how that was platted is what happened behind there, the Northwest Arterial came in. So in the early 90s, they were going through a rezoning process. Um, they're rezoning the property um, to R1 single family residential to build a subdivision. Um, they wanted to rezone a larger portion of that. However, at the time there was discussions with regards to the easement for the future Northwest Arterial. Um, the Zoning Advisory Commission did not approve a larger rezoning to that property. They wanted to confine it just to that area. Hence the reason why Tiffany Court is um, rezoned to R1 single family for that area. This is a current, um, well, April 1st of 2020 pictometry view. Um, as you can see here, this is Tiffany Court that's coming up here. This is the existing Stub Street that goes right to the property line. Um, this is the home that was placed on where that temporary cul-de-sac easement. And now there is a, a gravel or a mixed asphalt a milling turnaround easement, uh, property on the adjoining property, which is owned by the developer. So as we move through this, and it's gone through multiple plats, plats showing that there was always an intention for Tiffany Court to be extended to the adjoining property to the west, even after the Northwest Arterial came through for their, for their development. Um, so when we talk about um, stub streets, and when we look at development, as development occurs throughout our community, um, we have to look at a subdivision, and we don't want landlocked subdivisions. We don't want one access that comes in and provides access to a whole bunch of properties. We need to have that street connectivity that ties into additional neighborhoods and it creates that st street network that we have. So with the proposed concept plan, and I just want to reiterate, this is a concept plan, that this isn't a final plat. This isn't necessary how it's totally going to wind up at the end, but this is what we have before us to work uh, for us. We do have stub streets that are extended to the, to the east of the property for future connectivity. As the development um, on that east side of the property where it will be developed, there will be ongoing discussions of how the street network would flow through those areas in addition to how it could connect to either 32nd Street or um, in this case, Olympic Heights to the, to the east of the property. Uh, I need to get out of here and go to... Where's my stub streets? Sheena? Am I missing it? Uh, so I got zoomed out here. There we go. So um, as I mentioned before, as we look at residential developments, and this is included in your packet of information, um, we look at the stub streets to provide for future connectivity throughout our community. And included in your packet, I have three, three um, PDFs of the city of Dubuque. And the areas that are showing in red are for future connectivities. This is where stub streets are stubbed into undeveloped property um, for that development. And then we have areas that are actually uh, shown with a green circle. And those are areas where there was a stub street that were actually extended to continue that future connectivity throughout our, throughout our community. And as we look through this area, um, this upper portion up here to the right, if you can see my arrow, um, we have uh, the connection. This is Tiffany Court where it stubs into the property and then uh, Brook, which was a court, which was extended as a stub street. Um, or a stub street to Tiffany Court um, for those connectivities. But as you can see, as we work through our entire community, we have a lot of stub streets in order to allow that connectivity to happen. Now, there are a lot of opportunities where people who have lived in these areas for a long period of time get accustomed to basically somewhat living on a dead-end street, uh, dead street that's a stub street. Um, we did have some rezonings, and I think, Mr. Russell, you were on here. I know, Martha, you were. Um, we had a rezoning for um, Sky Blue Estates, which was a subdivision off of Roosevelt Road that talked about future connectivity to Jonathan Drive, which is a connectivity to Shiras Avenue, which had a lot of con uh, concerns with it because that was basically creating a connectivity from Roosevelt Road down through that residential neighborhood to Shiras Avenue. 
Those streets were established a, a long period of time and longer than this subdivision here. Um, but those intentions throughout the entire community happen uh, quite regularly as we look at development. Um, with the Tiffany Court subdivision, it has been since 1994 um, that uh, development is platted and it started. Um, the question was, is like, why hasn't um, this additional land been extended or built on? Um, I can't answer that specifically. We have never received any requests. Um, there could be some additional things that was it for sale? Was it available for purchase? Um, was it just being used for land access? All I know right now is that the property um, was up for sale, it's been purchased, and now we're having a request come before you for rezoning um, for a potential development. Let's get back to... All right. So, as I step through here and, there, and kind of read through my staff analysis, I'm just going to kind of explain some of the processes that we go through when we look at development and, um, and uh, the, the site that we're dealing with here specifically. So as I noted, the applicant's request is to rezone this property. So that's what's before you tonight. You're not approving a subdivision. You're not approving a plat, per se. Um, you're not approving access. What you're looking at approving, is it appropriate to rezone this property from agricultural land to R1 single family and to R4 um, development? Um, in our unified development code, as we look at subdivisions, we require two points of access for a subdivision when they have over 40 lots. In this case, I'm going off the conceptual plan because that's what we have before us. Um, they're looking at approximately 105 lots, so that's where we kick in the additional access requirements. Um, the engineering department has looked at this, and there has been quite a bit of discussion about the Northwest Arterial, about the ability to have either a full interchange or a ride-in, ride-out access. Um, during those discussions, um, it has been determined that at this time, only ride-in, ride-out access would be allowed to this property. Um, there would have to be further discussions about whether or not they would be granted a full interchange, full access um, to the Northwest Arterial. However, after a lot of discussion, it's been very clear to us that a right in right access will be the only thing allowed at the site for that location. Um, access is being proposed to be an extension of Tiffany Court um, into the property as an extended stub street. Um, Tiffany Court is a 50 foot wide right of way, 31 feet of pavement. It does go down to West 32nd Street. The engineering department did do detailed speed studies through this area to calculate the rate of vehicles and the uh, speed that our people are traveling up and down towards 32nd Street. They did some analysis of the access where Tiffany Court, it does meet um, what we call SUDAS, which, uh, SUDAS, which is our requirements, uh, statewide urban design, um, site specification requirements, don't quote me on that. But it, engineering uh, documents that state how far distances are based on the rate of speed that our people are traveling on 32nd Street. Um, in order to have access and enter in and out of the property. And 32nd Street does meet all those requirements um, at the Tiffany Court location. And shown on this concept plan, and once again, I'm just gonna reiterate it's a concept plan. There is a proposed access um, that they're proposing that comes down to 32nd Street at that location. Um, engineering has been doing analysis about that. Um, we do have requirements for um, spacing for when two streets meet in a, uh, a minor arterial, which is what West 32nd Street is, typically we like to have 30 feet spacing for offsets. Um, in this case, this is closer than that, this does not meet that, that offset requirement. Um, that would be something that would require additional review or approval in order to allow this close offset with Killarney Court to the south. The other things that they're looking at is the geometry of the street. And as you can see here, there's curves as we come up along West 32nd Street. Um, that impacts some site visibility uh, as we look up and down on West 32nd Street. They take in that consideration, but before they do that, they have to figure out what, what speed are people traveling through here, through that speed study, which I think a lot of the neighbors were able to see maybe some black boxes on the road and some other things where they're trying to factor in, you know, traffic counts and how often people are going through the area. And included in my packet of information, you can see the average daily trips located on West 32nd Street that was provided by the Iowa Department of Transportation since 2001 to current. And then also additional traffic counts that the engineering department were able to 
um, obtain in April this year to, to see if that's the case. Um, there is a significant drop in traffic counts on 32nd Street come around 2002, 2003. What happened during that time? Northwest Arterial was open. So that did alleviate quite a bit of, of vehicle traffic on West 32nd Street um, in order to get um, that arterial use from basically the downtown area, Central Avenue to the west side. Um, so it's been really kind of consistent to be between the 3,000 and 4,000 vehicle trips on West 32nd Street through the area. Um, topography is also a concern. So this document here kind of shows the grade and the, of the area. Whoops, I was hoping to zoom in there one second. The actual grade of the proposed um, access down to 32nd Street is rather, rather steep. Um, as we look at that, um, plans for that, um, details would have to be designed for a street that could be able to go up that area. In addition to looking at the site access, the offset spacing requirements, and uh, doing some just preliminary designs for uh, that layout there just conceptually, we're looking at a street that might be in the great percentage of 14 and a half to 15 or 16%. Um, so to give you an idea of, of those types of grades, Tiffany Court is currently 12% grade as you come off of 32nd, 32nd Street. Um, city, uh, streets in the city that are comparable would be um, uh, Cox Street as you come up off of Kirkwood Avenue going up the backside to Loris College. Uh, another example of, the, of that percentage of grade uh, street is uh, Lowell Street as it goes from Hempstead Street up to Herald Street. So there is concerns with the steepness of the roadway, especially when we look at um, vehicle and traffic safety maneuvering such steep streets. We do have steep streets in the city. We do have some streets that are actually over 20%, believe it or not. We don't want any streets over 20%. Um, we really, when we start looking at streets getting around the 10, per, 10 or 12%, that's where we're really starting to get to the point where we're trying to keep those grades of the streets down. So um, we're dealing with topography and existing grades for West 32nd Street and Tiffany Court. Um, what comes into play there is we have to have transitional zones as you enter on the roadway, so you're not coming straight down right to the street, where there's an opportunity where a vehicle may slide out in the intersection as we're trying to stop during a, a slick um, you know, snow or, or stand, uh, rain event for that. So when we look at that, we also look at what happens to that roadway. So you're doing a lot of cutting and filling. You're putting up a lot of retaining walls. Um, you're trying to make that roadway a little bit accessible. And then we, we mentioned before, and there was some discussion about emergency access. The fire department um, looks at how they can access to that site. So in this case, if we have a right in, right out onto Northwest Material, knowing where the fire station is located on JFK, Obviously, most likely they're going to come up JFK and the Northwest Arterial and take that access into the site. But we also look at other opportunities of that steepness of that street. So there are concerns with the steepness of the street, the offset from the existing Killarney Court, site visibility, and then the speed of 32nd Street. So those are all being taken into consideration. Um, and a lot of times that will be taken into consideration as we go through the platting process. So when they actually submit an actual preliminary plan of the site showing how they're gonna lay the streets out, where the accesses are actually gonna come through, what's the size of the, the streets, what are the grades of the street, um, that will all get discussed through that code review process at, at, at nauseum. Actually, we've done quite a bit of detailed studying um, for just a rezoning right now for the engineering department to do some of those analysis because we have been re receiving a lot of comments from the neighbors with, recurrence, uh, with concerns to the, the access and the visibility. Um, there has been a lot of discussion about um, a lot of the traffic coming from the development through Tiffany Court. If there is no access down to 32nd Street, that, is, that would be the case. There will be additional traffic coming through Tiffany Court. As development happens and lots get developed or any future development, there will be an increase in traffic. One discussion will be is, um, is it advantageous um, to go out the Northwest Arterial and take a ride if you're going to the West. I, I totally agree with the neighbors. Most people are not gonna go that route. They're either gonna work their way through Tiffany Court or if there is some other opportunity for another access down to 32nd Street, that might be an option. Um, I think we've heard tonight where we have an existing Tiffany Court 
And not everyone's using Tiffany Court lives on Tiffany Court. You, I think we've heard a comment that said half of them may actually not even use Tiffany Court through there. That's another scenario here where we have a street that may get put in. We're gonna require connectivity to the existing Tiffany Court, but there's no guarantee that people will use that as their main access in and out of the property. Um, the other thing is as people come and go from the site, um, there'll be probably more people obviously leaving and going west if they're going west, but coming home from the west there's a lot of opportunities where they'll be taking that Northwest Arterial, even some residents that live in the Tiffany Court area may be taking the Northwest Arterial, taking that right in off the Northwest Arterial and coming to their home um, as they return home as opposed to exiting. Um, so you might see more and more, but then, then again, uh, that all depends on through a traffic study and analysis as they look through that, because um, obviously not everyone goes to work to the West, they go to the East, not everyone um, goes to the grocery shopping or access, but I will say a lot of the traffic as it exits will probably be going through the Tiffany Court and uh, Brook and Blossom neighborhoods for that area. Um, as we look through, um, as I mentioned, the preliminary plat and the, and the final plat process that will go through the Zoning Advisory Commission, it will go through the City Council. So there'll be additional opportunities for public input as those plats are being uh, presented and have opportunities for additional discussion. Um, like I mentioned, we're just looking at a concept plan, and I do not like looking at certain things where um, uh, there's opportunities where some, some things get conditioned on a rezoning that may not be directly impacted by on how the improvement plans or the development or meeting the code requirements could actually be placed upon the property. One thing that we definitely do look at is when we look at development is, is in compliance with our comprehensive plan. And in this area, um, the land use plan has denoted the entire property to be R1 single family residential. So the future land use plan has identified this area to be used for R1 single family residential. That is the proposal that they're looking at doing for a majority of the site. There is a small portion on West 32nd Street that we talked about that they're looking at rezoning to R4 for multi-tenant row house type development. Um, in regards to that, imagine to view comprehensive plan recommendations. The comprehensive plan goal promotes infill and mixed use development. In this case, this is an infill development. The city's future land use map identifies the subject property as single family residential, which land use includes low density, single family homes, and related recreational, religious, and educational facilities that typically service a neighborhood population. Single family residential land use encourages a mix of housing, affordable for all segments of Dubuque's population throughout the community, including options for those who might be saving for their first home. Um, so when we look at this development from a rezoning standpoint, and we look as we move forward, it is in compliance with our comprehensive plan for future land use and meeting the goals. Also what's come before the city council is a few work sessions where we're talking about the need for housing. And we've heard tonight from a lot of the residences um, they like the development, the residential, the concern is the traffic and how access is gonna flow through the site. That seems to be the largest topic and we're hearing it loud and clear at the city and we're looking at the, as we move forward, if this was to be rezoned and um, recommended to go to the city council and if the council does approve it, um, additional uh, review, which will definitely be required as part of that improvement plan review for the plats will, be, will, will happen um, for that. Things that I wanna pull out and include in the application that was submitted and presented to you. Does she know where I get the big packet here? No. Uh, here we go, yep. And. We did receive uh, public input from uh, several property owners, including your packet was this uh, email that was provided to our office um, with a resident that lives on Brook, Lo Brook Road that had concerns about traffic um, through the area. Um, that's including your packet. Um, in addition, we handed out uh, an email that was just printed out today um, from another concerned citizen. Um, that lives in the in the area. Once again, they're not objecting to the, the residential development. They know that, that there was a stub street there, that there would be future connectivity. Their concerns is their opinion and their discussion is obviously access and how, where's the traffic coming from and how is it gonna flow through, through the development. Also, what was submitted to our office and included in here is a petition 
that was signed by several of the residences that you heard from tonight. And um, this petition um, addresses um, neighbor, neighborhood safety concerns, as they noted. Um, they mentioned financial harm with regards to property values to their, to their area, and they helped summarize quite a bit of the information. I'm not gonna go into great detail with that petition since it's included in your packet, but the one thing I do wanna to provide to you um, you know, it is a properly formatted petition, which we have names, email, signatures, addresses, and signatures. But we also created a notification, a map here um, that we just wanted to provide to you just to inform you. Um, those areas that are shaded in yellow are residents who have signed that petition. Um, the area in blue is the actual subject property. And then the area that's outlined in red is our 200 foot notification buffer. So a lot of times when we have uh, situations like this where we have a lot of neighbors that show up, why didn't I receive a notice? Our unified development code requires that we notify all property owners within 200 feet. Um, so when we do that, we have to go through our, our process or GIS and we do that notification. Um, we are required to do that, um, but anyone can attend and speak in opposition or in favor of the request. Um, that's part of the public hearing process. Um, but those are the ones that were actually required. We cannot be arbitrary and decide we're gonna, well, this person should be notified. If they're not within the 200 foot notification, they will not receive a notice from us from our office. But obviously, um, Eric Lucy and some of the other individuals here um, have an opportunity to have those neighborhood meetings and discussions to be able to come out and reach out to our, to our department. And I think, I think that's all I have at this, this time unless you guys have any questions for me. All right. Thank you, Wally. Does anyone on the commission have any questions for Wally? Pat or Brittany, any questions for Wally? No, I guess I don't have any questions. I'm sorry, this is Pat. Um, I think I think there were some very good points brought up on um, both sides of this request. Um, I do think that at this stage of the game, we're just purely talking about, you know, should we move this land from a placeholder, which is agricultural, which everything brought into the city is an in agriculture, into um, an actual zoning designation that is going to be somewhat useful. I think it complies with the city zoning, um, the long range plan. Um, you know, I, I think there, there are definitely some issues that need to be worked out, such as access. Um, I think some of the issues that the that neighbors over in over Long Castlewood and some of those areas have with people cutting through, I hate to say it, but I'm not sure that's really this particular land's problem. I think that's more of a enforcement of speed limits and and that sort of thing that needs to be addressed. And that's not really in purview of this uh, this organization. But I guess at this point, I'm. I'm thinking I'm in favor of it. All right. Thanks, Pat. So, yeah, we'll kind of continue with uh, discussion here by the commission. You have something to add, Wally? Yep. Uh, Vice Chair uh, Kemp, I just wanted to, I forgot I didn't answer uh, on a couple other questions. There was a question um, that was posed to us about uh, construction equipment, um, if this were to be developed. Um, that gets handled through the platting process and the improvement plans. Um, as we move forward through that. So, um, you know, as they have that discussions, you know, there could be opportunities that it, construction equipment goes off the Northwest Arterial for a construction road entrance. We wouldn't know that specifically until we further get into the planning process um, for the development of the property um, at that time, so. Okay, thank you. We'll continue discussion. Yeah, I, I do wanna add that I agree with the neighbors in terms of the accesses provided to the Sub proposed subdivision. Uh, we'll be looking at that when they bring in the preliminary plat, but my my personal opinion is the more access is the better. So uh, I really like the idea of the uh, roundabout on the arterial and the connection to Olympic Heights. And uh, I'd strongly encourage the uh, city to look at the new access to West 32nd as a necessary uh, requirement. Right. Thanks. Thanks. 
And yeah, I'll just kind of echo what you and Pat had said. I mean, it sounds like the consensus is they're in favor of the subdivision. It's just the access. But again, stressing that we're not voting, approving, or denying the access points at this time. We're just approving the re rezoning. Anyone else have any comments, questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion. <clears throat> I move we uh, recommend approval of the rezoning from AG to R1 and R4 as uh, shown on the rezoning e exhibit that was in our packet. All right, we have a motion. Can I have a second, please? I have a second that. Second by Martha, thank you. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. Can staff please call the roll? Leffel Holtz. Aye. Norton. Aye. Russell? Aye. Christ? Aye. Kemp? Aye. That motion was approved and will go on to the June 6, 2020 uh, City Council meeting. I'll turn it back over to Matt. Commissioner Kemp. Okay, we will move on to our last item on the agenda is a text amendment. Um, let's see, regarding the amendment of the Unified Development Code section 1685.10.1, um, is our applicant here? Yes, so uh, Assistant Planner Jason Duba. Um, this matter came to our attention recently when a citizen inquired about uh, constructing an accessory dwelling unit on his property. He currently rents the primary dwelling unit to some relatives and he wanted to build an accessory dwelling unit and live in it himself. Our code currently does not allow that as the property owner is required to live in the primary dwelling unit and the accessory dwelling unit could be rented out. So. This text amendment would allow either the primary dwelling unit or the accessory dwelling unit to, to be the uh, residence of the property owner. Um, and in, in reviewing that change, we also considered whether uh, it would be beneficial to expand the range of zoning districts that are allowed to have accessory dwelling units. Currently, they're only allowed in R1 single family dwelling, or R1 single family zones. And that's because R1 districts are required to have single family detached housing. So uh, we felt that a fair way to allow other zoning districts to enjoy the um, ability to have uh, detached accessory structures would be to allow them on properties where the principal dwelling is a single family detached dwelling. Um, these would all remain as conditional uses, so anyone uh, wishing to pursue an accessory dwelling unit would have to apply for a conditional use permit that would be reviewed by staff and it would have to be approved by the Zoning Board of Adjustment and um, there are a number of requirements um, that are going to remain um, and things like lot coverage, setbacks, um, those would all be considered through the conditional use permit process. So there would still be oversight of these, but we do feel that it, it would be potentially a beneficial way to add some infill housing, um, some additional rental income for property owners and just give people some, some flexibility for enjoying their property. Great. Thank you, Jason. Um, any questions for our applicant this evening? Uh, Pat, Britt, any questions? No, not at this time. Okay, thank you. I'm, I don't. Okay, uh, we'll open the floor for any public input regarding the request. 
Okay, seeing none, we'll close the floor for pl public input, assuming no rebuttal. Jason, um, right. on that, a staff report, please, <laughs> if anything. So Jason did do the staff report, yeah. but I just I would like just to add an additional discussion point. Um, we're also seeing those situations where um, people are aging in their homes, and a lot of times the homes, they may be able to be accessed through stairs and when they're a little bit younger of age, um, but they get a little bit older and they want to be able to stay on their own property. So the, the ability to have a detached accessory structure to make it more AD accessible for themselves um, and then be able to still be able to reside on their home and be able to lease out that property um, for additional um, use is another advantage um, for the request that we're looking at going before you guys. Okay, any questions, comments, nothing? Okay, with that, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, okay, I'd like to make a motion to recommend approval of the text amendment. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that motion. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Christ? Kemp? Aye. Leffelholtz? Aye. Norton? Aye. Russell? Aye. Mulligan? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Um, Wally, does this go to the yes. City yes. Council? Yes, this will, will be on the May 16th City Council agenda. May 16th, yep. yes. okay. Thank you much. Okay, with that, those are all of the um, action items and public hearings that we had. Are there any items from the public? Okay. Uh, any items from the commission? Uh, yeah, I, I would suggest that staff connect with the neighborhood that was concerned about the rezoning so that they know when uh, um, the plats are proposed so they can keep track of the process. Okay. So, no, so noted. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Anything from staff this um, evening? Yeah, items from staff. So um, this is the time of year where we have our uh, boards and commission goal setting um, documents. Uh, Martha has gone through this several times. So <laughs> typically um, what we will do is we'll be emailing out to each individual um, a goal setting document if there's certain initiatives um, that you would like to see the city council move forward that may pertain to um, this board and commission. Um, we provide a lot of that information in that document that you'll receive via email. Um, one thing to note um, is our unified development code, right? So we did receive funding through the city council for fiscal year 2023. That'll start July 1 to do a unified development code update. Um, we've had a lot of plans have been adopted since 2009 when, when the Unified Development Code was um, adopted um, with regards to our Equitable Poverty Reduction and Prevention Plan, Comprehensive Plan, Climate Action Plan, um, Arts and Cultural Plan. We have a lot of plans. Um, but then there's opportunities, and, and you've seen this lately, right? We keep sending you text amendments. Um, we have several of them actually piled up in our office um, that we've been looking at getting updated as we move through this. And as through that process, we will be asking individuals from this commission to um, get on some of uh, focus groups, some individual groups, as we look through the, the uh, development of different aspects of the Unified Development Code. Um, so that's one of the initiatives um, that I'll provide to you. But then also some successes in, this, uh, in the Zoning Advisory Commission. Quite a few of those are those text amendments that we're trying to move forward, some of our comprehensive plan goal elements. You guys reviewed. Um, text amendments on community gardens, on child care, on greenhouses just recently, and now we just talked about accessory dwelling units, and in the future we might have another one that might come here um, shortly before you. Yeah, just try to be able to make our, our code a little bit more flexible, a little bit more developable. Um, our other boards of commissions have identified this format, the ability to have information before you in a PowerPoint presentation electronically um, at your fingertips. As you know, previously, previous years it was a piece of paper and we didn't have the ability for anyone to look at the information. Even members in the audience couldn't be able to relate. So I think just that ability to have that technology at our fingertips 
um, has helped out with quite a, quite a bit of our discussions for that. So um, we will be sending that information out to you via email if you can just respond and get back to us. Um, I'm compiling that and then we provide that on to um, our uh, um, person who's handling that, Corey Burbach, our assistant um, city manager, will then funnel that information to the city council for goal setting. So, Great. Um, that's all I have. Sounds exciting. Okay. Um, with that, I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. No moved. No <laughs> moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Meeting adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, guys.